I think we can get started. So we have Dr. Um, we have Scott Evans with us today. He is a paleontologist at Virginia Tech, and he works with some of the fossils that are the old, some of the oldest fossils on our entire planet. So he is going to talk about what he does. So I'll turn it over to Scott. And just you know, we are recording this, so if people um, sure. are, they'll um, be able to watch it later. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon, I should say. Uh, but actually, uh, I, wanna, I wanted to first tell you guys, uh, I'm, I'm coming to you live actually from the Outback. Uh, so I don't know if, do you guys know where the Outback is? No, the Outback is in Australia. Um, and so I, I'm not in the US right now. I'm actually uh, here, here in Australia and in, in an hour or so I'll drive out to, uh, to go look at some, some rocks outside here. And I'll go past some some kangaroos and emus on that drive, uh, most certainly. So, um, yeah. So I should say good day, because uh, that's that's what they say uh, down under here in Australia. Um, and I'm really excited to to be talking to you guys today. Um, so yeah, th there's only a few of us. I don't know. Can do you guys mind? Uh, so I'm Scott, uh, and you can definitely call me Scott. I don't know if you guys just want to <laughs> just just uh, introduce yourselves. Is that is that okay? Yeah, we can do that. I'm Kelly. So I run the Mega Brain Kids Club at Hastings Public Library along with my coworker. This is Taylor. Yeah, hello. You guys want to introduce yourself? Hi, Kelly and Taylor. Nice to meet you. Hello. Uh, I'm Aaliyah. And this is my Hi, Aaliyah. brother. Gerardo. Hi, Aaliyah and Gerardo. Good to see you. And my name is Aquia. Aquia, hey, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, again, I, I'm, I'm so excited to, to come to you guys uh, from, from all the way here in Australia. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm a, a paleontologist. Um, and so do you guys know, I, I'll try and have you guys participate as much as I do. Do you guys know what a paleontologist does? So, all right, yeah. So a paleontologist studies fossils. Mm. How about fossils? Do you know what those are? Um, they're like bones from um, animals that died a long time ago. Yep. Yeah, bones from animals. That's a great example. Um, yeah, but so a fossil, and, and a lot of people think of bones. A lot of people think of dinosaurs or mammoths. Um, those are the first types of fossils we think of. But a fossil can really be any remains of, of a, something that was once alive that is now preserved in rocks. Um, so fossils can be of lots of different living things that, that you guys probably see every day. So that we have fossils of, of things with bones like dinosaurs and mammals. We have fossils of things like trees that their trunks or their leaves will be preserved in rock. Um, there are fossils of algae, there are fossils of coral um, all sorts of different types of fossils that exist. Um, and one of my favorite fossils actually, uh, as a kid were fossils of shells. And so when I, I was your age, uh, when I would be, um, but not in New York state where they have sort of the skyscrapers uh, down in the city, but, but up where it's a little more rural, uh, my driveway actually was lined with stones. And in those stones were tiny shells um, that are about 300 million years old, um, when New York State was actually covered in ocean. And so as a kid, I love just searching through those, those stones in my driveway to try and find fossils and collect fossils. And that's something that, that I love to do. I loved exploring. And now today, I get to do that. It's just my job, and I get paid to do it. And I get paid to come to really cool places like Australia um, and just do that same thing I was doing as a kid, only... Uh, maybe just a little more organized collecting of those different fossils. So I hope that, that you guys, you know, if there's something that you love to do now, it doesn't have to be fossils. It could be you love writing or reading or, uh, you know, going to the beach, going to the ocean, going outside, um, anything you love to do. I hope, I hope you try to find a way to do that as a living because it's, it's really fun and it means uh, you don't have to work that hard um, if you love what you're doing. 
So um, yeah, so so studying fossils has, has brought me all the way to the outback, and and you're probably wondering why, if where I grew up in New York, there are a ton of fossils. Why do I fly all the way to the middle of Australia uh, to study fossils? And that's because here in Australia, they have some of the oldest uh, animals that ever lived on Earth. So these animals are are older than than mammoths and mastodons, older than the dinosaurs. Um, they're really the first animals that we know of that existed on Earth. Um, and so they're really important for understanding how, you know, we got the diversity of animal life that's around today. So these animals are so old, you know, I mentioned that they're all different types of fossils. Um, these animals don't are so old that they haven't figured out how to make bones yet. So these animals don't have a skeleton. They don't have things like leaves like trees do, um, or even things like shells, like those fossils that I loved collecting as a kid in New York. They're, they're soft and squishy, right? So think of something like a jellyfish or a worm. Um, those are what some of these first animals would have looked like. Um, and, and so they're very rare. It's really hard, as you can imagine, to, to preserve a jellyfish in a rock. Um, but here in Australia, that, that's exactly what we have. And so it's really cool. And these are really important for, for our understanding of animal life. But it's probably a little boring for me to talk about it. So I thought I'd try and show you guys some of these because I'm all the way down here in Australia, uh, running along the hillside and, and collecting these different fossils. So I thought I'd do a little show and tell. So here, so one of the things is that light is really important for these fossils. So I'm going to do something a little strange. I'm going to turn off my lights here and use a headlamp to try and show you the fossils. So, ah, so, it, oh no, it's a little too bright. So can you guys see that fossil? <laughs> How about now? Is that a little better? Yeah. So this is a fossil uh, called Dickinsonia. And so you can see um, it kind of has that a central line. It's a circle um, or a circle with a bite out of it. And then it has a little line running down the middle. And then it has all these dividing lines that run along the, the length of the body. Um, so yeah, so this one's called Dickinsonia. There's another one down here on the same rock. Um, so I'll ask you guys first, what do you think that, that fossil looks like? Any ideas? Does it look like anything you've seen alive today? Yeah, Kuya, do you have an idea? A snail. Snail. Yeah, that's a really good guess. Any other guesses? All right. Well, well I'll, uh, I'll tell you guys that it's, it's a little bit of a trick question. It's a little bit of a mean question because we actually don't know what that fossil is. And part of my job is actually to try and figure out what these, what these animals were, right? We know that they were animals, but they might be something like snails. And a snail is a really great guess um, because they're probably related to something like snails. Um, but there are lots of different theories about what Dickinsonia might have been um, and what who it might be related to that's still around today or whether it's extinct and not related to anything that's around today. Um, but, but a snail, if we was a great guess. Um, and that's something that, that scientists are still arguing about what they could be. And that's the reason I still come here to the Outback is to try to figure out if they are or are not closely related to snails. Some things we do know about that fossil though, um, we know that like a snail, Dickinsonia could move around on the seafloor. And it's one of the first animals to be able to move around, which is really important, right? If you guys get hungry later, right? You're gonna get up and you're gonna walk to your kitchen to get food. Um, and so that ability to move to food is really important for the survival of most of the animals that we know that live today. Um, and so that we have the first evidence of that here in the outback, another reason why I come here. Um, that Dickinsonia that I showed you is, is pretty small, um, 
but some Dickinsonia could actually be more than three feet long. So there's this really flat organism, sort of think of like a pancake sitting on the seafloor and they could get up to three feet long. So a really big flat pancake that would have slowly crawled along the seafloor a really, really long time ago. So it's really weird and it's so different from anything that's around today. Um, but these are some of our first relatives, our first ancestors that we find in the fossil record. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, tr I'll try one more. We'll see if we can do this, this headlamp thing again and I can show you a different fossil. All right, let's see. So you can see the chalk, hopefully. Oh no, so it's still dark here. The sun isn't up, so we don't have good light. Oh, there, can you maybe see it now? See, it's kind of long and almost like a banana shaped. And up at the top here is, is sort of a head. And then it has these sort of lines dividing it down the middle. Anyway, this fossil, this is another fossil here from the outback, and this fossil is called Spragina. And I wanted to tell you about Spragina because it's actually the, the state fossil of South Australia, and it's named for a guy named Reg Sprague, who uh, in a long time ago, about 70 years ago, uh, actually discovered these fossils here in South Australia. And so Reg actually worked uh, for for um, the government. And his job was to go around and, and uh, describe different types of rocks that are found in Australia. But Reg didn't really like that very much. He, like me, he loved searching for fossils. And so the place where they originally sent Reg, uh, he just kept looking for fossils and actually wasn't really doing his job. He was just searching for fossils all the time because he loved looking for fossils. So they said, I know what we'll do. We'll send Reg to rocks that are so old that there are no fossils, that no animals exist. And what Reg did was actually found the first and oldest animals that ever existed on Earth. And so, again, I just want to tell you guys, you know, if you love to do something, it's, it, you know, try to find a way to do it because you can make really big discoveries uh, just because of that passion or, or that love that you might have for something. Um, and so that fossil, again, that's called Spragina, and it's named after Reg Sprig, who, who was the first guy to discover uh, these fossils. Um, yeah, so, so another thing I thought might be a little fun was to tell you guys about the tools. Because I'm here in the field, I'm about to go uh, search for these fossils. Uh, I wanted to show you some of the different tools that I use every day as a paleontologist. Um, so the first tool I'll show you. Um, is, is this, this is kind of the biggest tool we use. This is called a rock hammer. Um, and it's really good for, for sort of smashing through dirt and rock. Um, and so I do use this tool. I do keep it in my backpack. Um, but this is actually not a tool I use very often because these fossils are so rare and so delicate, we don't want to break them. And so even though we might use this tool to get other rocks and stuff that's on top of these fossils, once we get close to the layers that have these fossils, we actually put the hammers away and we don't use them very often. We start to use much more careful tools, uh, sort of like this. Have you guys ever seen anything like this in your house? Do you know what this is? Yeah, this is a dish brush, right? So this is the same brush. Some of you might have a sponge, but some of you might have a brush that you use to clean off your dishes, to wash them off at the end of the day after you've eaten a meal. We use the same fossil to brush off our rocks and get things like dirt off them, but we do it very carefully so that we don't hurt the fossils that are really, really delicate and hard to preserve. Um, we also use another tool we use to carefully remove uh, dirt and things that get on top of these fossils um, are things like this. I'll try and pull one out. So do you see what this is? Do you, has anyone ever had one of these? Uh, I'm sure you all probably have. This is actually the same tools a dentist use when they clean their teeth. And I won't do it now because this has been on rock. Um, but we use these same old dentist tools to pick out all of the, 
the grime and dirt that gets stuck on top of those fossils. So we can see all the details of the fossils really, really clearly. So, you know, I, I think my parents and my friends, they think I spend all my time digging and I do spend a little bit of time digging, but I spend much more time when I'm here in the outback with this guy here, this dental pick, picking off all the dirt that's on top of these fossils. Um, we use another very highly technical tool, which you guys have already seen. Um, so I have this box that I keep in my backpack at all times. This is chalk, right? And so chalk is really useful because when we have these rocks, right, with our fossils on them, we can just write on them, right? And we can underline where fossils exist. We can draw arrows or circles where we think fossils are moving or where we think the ancient waves were coming through. Um, and so chalk is one of the most important tools I carry around. And every time we do our laundry here, you know, thousands of pieces of chalk come out at the bottom uh, from our pockets because we're carrying it around all the time. Um, the last and probably most important tool that we use here is this. So do, have you guys ever seen a sort of egg like this? I don't know if people use these still. Do you know what comes inside of this egg? What was that, Aquia? Do you know what comes inside of it? No, I thought it was food. Oh, food. No, not food. It's a toy. Uh, so you guys, may, maybe uh, this is an old toy that I played with as a kid that isn't so popular anymore. But this is a toy called Silly Putty. Have you guys ever heard of Silly Putty? I see. So silly putty is this. Sorry. What was that? I was like, uh, Emily and Lily did comment in the chat that they thought it was silly putty. They guessed right. Oh, nice. Sorry, I wasn't even looking at the chip. Yeah, yeah. Great job, Emily and Lily. Yeah. So this is silly putty. So this is fun, stretchy stuff you can you can uh, play with and make all sorts of things with. But the thing it's really good for here, and the reason why we use it, is because. The fossils that I showed you are actually the impressions of organisms in sand. And so if we take our silly putty, so I have a rock here, I'm going to take a silly putty and we push it down into that impression, we actually get a mold of what the fossil would have looked like. So my light isn't very good, but can you guys see that little fossil? It's sort of a triangle with an anchor in the middle. It kind of looks yeah, like this, the this first leaf or something. The, first, the leaf. first leaf. Yeah, that's a great guess. But yeah, this is a fossil we call Parvancarina, right? Um, and you can see that because it has the anchor shape. And much like that fossil Dickinsonia, we don't know exactly what it's related to, um, but we do think that it could also move around and actually it could change the way that anchor was pointed to actually help it maybe with something like feeding, like getting food out of the water uh, in the ocean. Um, and so that's another really important early fossil um, that was probably sensing things about uh, the, the world around it um, and, and getting information so it could orient itself in the right way so that it could feed and, and get food. Um, yeah, so uh, the last thing I, I guess I was, I was hoping to, to talk to you guys about was try and give you an idea of just how old these fossils are. Um, and so I wanted to do a, a little exercise. So, so these fossils um, are, are very, very old. And it's really hard to picture millions and millions and millions of years of time. And so one of the things I like to think about is thinking about the whole history of Earth as if it were one single day, right? So for you guys, the day is, is uh, you know, it's it's late afternoon there. Um, for me, the day is just beginning. It's it's about uh, 7 a.m. here in Australia. Um, but we all know about how long a day is, right? And so if we think about the whole history of Earth as a day, yeah, 24 hours, as a 24 hour cycle, um, the Earth will then, um, have formed at midnight, right? So at the very start of our day when we're all asleep. Um, and so then if we keep going into the early AMs, right? When you guys are asleep, 
the first living things we think show up at around 5 a.m., right? So pretty early, right? Before even I'm up this morning to talk to you guys, before I'm sure most of you guys uh, get up in the morning, that's the first time we get life. So we've had life around for a really long time on this planet, but that life was really small. They were single-celled organisms. You would have needed a microscope if you traveled back in time to see them in that those early morning hours. So the first uh, things that get big, the first things that figure out how to be multiple cells working together, which we call multicellular organisms, right? Those don't show up. Does anyone have a guess when those would show up in the clock? When were the first things that were more than one cell? Yeah, clear, go ahead. 1 a.m. 1 a.m., uh, it's a little later than that. All right. Yeah, it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to imagine. But the first uh, the first things that were more than one cells don't show up until about two p.m. Right. So all the way in the afternoon. Right. You guys have probably woken up. You've gone to school. You've had your breakfast. You've had your lunch. You've probably learned a whole lot. And at two p.m. Right. So that's pretty late in the day for the first thing that are just two cells living together to figure that out. Right. And then the next major step in Earth's history is the, the, these first animals that we find in Australia. How about any guesses for when those might've shown up? Aaliyah, do you have a guess? Mm. I forgot. That's okay. So those, those don't show up. Oh yeah, Kuya, you have a guess? 11 p.m. Oh, 11 p.m. Yeah, that's a great guess. Um, so it's actually, it's about 9.30 when those fossils first show up. So pretty close. But think about that. If the history of Earth was just one day, the, these fossils, the oldest animals that look really weird and nothing like any animals that are around today don't show up until after we've already had our whole day, we've gone to school, we've come home, we've done our homework. And probably if you're anything like me, you're almost ready for bed. You know, maybe you're having your ice cream, you're, you're getting ready for bed. Uh, and that's when the first weird, wacky animals show up. The first things that can get up and go, you know, move to a different part of the seafloor don't show up till 930. The dinosaurs, right? We think of dinosaurs as really ancient and really far away from us. They wouldn't show up till 11 p.m., right? So, um, these animals that I study are twice as old actually as the dinosaurs, right? And humans, of course, have only been on the planet for a very short period of time. So they wouldn't show up until the last minute or so of that day on Earth. Um, and so the history of Earth is huge and there's so much that happened on this planet. Um, and so that's one of the really fun things and the things I love about my job is that we can actually explore that planet uh, as paleontologists and sort of go back in time and study these very, very, very old uh, and first animals that, that ever existed. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that's kind of all I, all I had planned. Uh, thank you guys for, for your participation. Um, but I was hoping uh, if you guys have any questions for me, I'm, I'm happy to, to chat with you guys uh, a little longer and, and see, you know, if you have any questions about what it's like to be a paleontologist or, uh, you know, anything, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you. If you don't want to ask out loud, you can type your questions in the chat also. How long do you usually work? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, so we, we work, uh, we work because we're only here for a very short period of time. We work all day. Um, so as soon as the sun gets up in the morning, right, you saw that it's really hard to see these fossils without the right light. So we go out as soon as the sun hits, first hits these rocks in the morning, and we stay out until the sun goes down. Um, but because we come to Australia, it's actually winter here and not summer. And so the days are actually a lot shorter, but we, we usually leave here before eight and we don't get back till after five. Um, so, so, but that's all the sunlight that we have down here uh, in Australian winter. And then I come out here. So I've been out in the outback for about three weeks now, and I'll be here for another three weeks after this. So 
we come for about you know a, a month or two each time um, and to spend as much time as we can uh, with with these fossils. So yeah, so every morning we we pack up our lunch, we pack up our coffee, uh, we drive about two miles out into the hillside, and uh, and we spend all day outside, uh, pretty much whether it rains, whether there's a lot of wind, uh, or whether it's beautiful and sunny and hot. Uh, we we spend all day out there uh, studying these rocks and, and learning everything we can. How long have you been a paleontologist? You've been doing this for a long time, or? Um, yeah, so I, I have been a paleontologist <laughs> for, well, it's, I, I have trouble with when I started as a paleontologist because uh, I, I had a rock, as I said, I had a rock collection uh, when, I, when I was younger than you guys probably uh, from my driveway. And so anyone really can be a paleontologist, but uh, I, I started my, my school, uh, so I have a master's and a PhD in paleontology. That, I started that about eight years ago. Um, and actually, I first came here to the Outback about eight years ago, um, and I've come almost every summer since. Uh, so eight or nine years, I, I've been a, maybe a, a true paleontologist. Um, yeah. Looks like we've got oh, I see I see a chat from from Emily and Lily. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, so what's it like being a paleontologist? Um, it's it's really fun, like I said. So um, I love the fact that I get to explore these ancient worlds. You know, these that it's almost like getting to travel to a different planet to study these different life that existed very a very 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 long time ago. Um, I, you know, it's a, it's long days out in the field, but it's really fun. So. Um, you know, just, just this last week, we've been pulling over this brand new layer um, that no one has ever seen before, right? So we, we search around on the hillside for different fossils, and then we find the layer of rock where those fossils are coming from, and then we try to flip over that whole layer so we can see everything that's in there. Um, and it's really cool for me because I know that those, these fossils, have no one has seen them for 500 million years, right? And so I'm the first eyes that are gonna see that. And we find brand new things that haven't been named, no one's discovered before. So we get to name new fossils. Um, that's also really hard to understand, right? So, so Aquia said that this Dickinsonia looked like a snail. And I said, we can't, we don't know actually if it's a snail or not. Um, and so our job is, is to just you know, measure every detail of it, look at as many different ones as we can um, and try to describe what that is. So you have to be a little bit creative um, and think outside the box to, to study these very, these, um, you know, very weird and very different creatures from the ones that are around today. Yeah, Kuya, is that, is that a question? Yeah, um, can girls be paleontologists? Oh, of course, yeah. You, you don't have to be a boy. Yeah, you don't have, you, anyone can be a paleontologist. Uh, so actually um, my, my advisor, sort of my, my boss here, she is, she is a girl and uh, she's a paleontologist. We have um, another graduate student who, who's a girl here as well. Um, and, and really anyone can be a paleontologist. We have someone in our group um, who's a geologist who's interested in studying Mars. Um, and really all you need to be a paleontologist, just like I told you about Reg who discovered these fossils, he was just someone who was curious. He loved fossils, he loved searching for them. And so that's really all you need. You don't have to be um, someone who, who spent their life studying these fossils. Um, you just have to be interested in learning more about them. And that's really all it takes to be a good paleontologist. So can a dog be a paleontologist? Because you said that. A dog be a paleontologist. Anyone, yeah. Well, my dog, one. I'll tell you, I have a dog. I have a dog, his name is Winston. And I have taken him out with me in the field. Uh, I don't bring him all the way out to Australia. But he's great. He loves, for some reason, he loves smelling rocks that have fossils in them. 
Um, so he's very curious and, and I don't know if he'll write any papers anytime soon, but he's definitely curious about the fossils and, and he's not the worst paleontologist I've ever met. Where can, can, like in another part of the planet or earth where you can like study and dinosaur bones or something? Yeah, there, there are fossils all over the world, right? So um, almost anywhere, you, ju you just need the right type of rock. So I, I don't know if you guys uh, I know that there are three types of rock, but one type is called sedimentary rocks. And anywhere you find sedimentary rocks, you can find fossils. Um, so yeah, there are fossils all over the world. I study, I've, uh, you know, I collected fossils in New York where I grew up. Um, I've studied fossils in places like Montana, where they have dinosaur bones. Um, I've studied fossils in places like China, uh, in California, in the USA, um, and of course, all the way down here in Australia. Yeah, there are really, there are fossils everywhere. Um, you just have to know a little bit about where to look. Well, yeah, th those are those are great questions, and and yeah, really, really great participation. I, I, do you guys have any have any other last last minute questions? Oh, Can pets be paleontologists? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so you said that you've discovered things that haven't been seen before. So you get to name them. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Oh, are there rules? Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I actually area um, Wariudia, which are um, some some Aboriginal names for some places here uh, where we work in Australia. But yes, there there are rules. Uh, it's a very big book that's now available online um, that describes all the rules and how you pick the name and how they end. Um, but the really cool thing is that. You can pick anything as long as it's related to the fossil. Um, so we pick names uh, like Ikaria, which we named for it's a, it's a, a mountain that's that we can see from our field site, um, and and so we really like that name. Uh, but we've also named other fossils. We named a fossil um, Attenborides uh, Jane. So Attenborides is for David Attenborough. I don't know if you guys know him, but he's actually been to our site and he's a huge fan of the Ediacaran. Um, he's the guy who narrates a lot of the nature videos, the, the British guy who you've probably heard. Um, so we named it for him. And then we named it for uh, Jane Farger, who's the, who was the landowner here of the property where I'm staying. Um, and so, you know, we named them for how the fossil looks or the place where you found the fossil or people who are really important in helping you find the fossil or do the study. Um, so there are rules, but we also get, can have a little fun with it too. Yeah, another fossil, we have a lot of nicknames for fossils that we don't know. Um, so there was one fossil we had called, we called it Ropey, because it kind of looked like a rope. Um, and we ended up naming it Phoenicia because that's sort of the Latin for rope. So uh, yeah, so so a lot of different nicknames and, and yeah, we try to have fun with it whenever we can. Yeah, Kuya, you have another question? Um. So do you like live in a house or like a cabin or something? Um, yeah, so so here in Australia, we're actually um, in, in a house. Um, it's, it's called, the, we call it the Shearer's Quarters because actually um, many years ago, uh, people used to travel to different farms around here and they would shear the sheep uh, to get the wool from the sheep. And so they would move from place to place. And so this is kind of a cabin where there's those um, sheep shears would have stayed uh, many years ago. And now it, it's sort of equipped for us. But yeah, we have running water. Um, we have fridge and a stove and a microwave and a coffee maker, which is what I've been uh, drinking this morning. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not like a, a normal house, but it, it's great. Um, sometimes though, we also have to camp if, if the place is remote enough. Um, so so uh, it all depends on where the fossils are and, and how far they are from, from a good place to stay.
Yeah, well, again, I, I just want to thank you guys uh, so, so much. Um, it, it was really fun to talk to you. Um, and, and I hope you learned a little bit about, about what it's like to be a paleontologist. Um, but yeah, I actually, you know, the sun is going to be up soon. So uh, I think I'm going to go uh, try and get ready for the day and, and for a hard day of, of uh, dental picking and silly puttying. Thank you so much for joining us, for getting up before the sun even to talk to us. We really appreciate you taking time out of your work.